Romans. Romans is a letter, and uh, what do you know about the letters? How many letters are there in the New Testament? I'll tell you, this is a trick question. <laughs> you know for certain how many letters there are in the New Testament that are written by Paul and Peter and Jude and others. How many of those are there? It's kind of the most basic Christian facts. Okay, how many Gospels are there? We'll start there. Okay, now we, now we can uh, do the process of eliminating. Okay, how many total in the books of the New Testament? 27. 27, okay. Four Gospels, right now we're down to 23. Uh, the Book of Acts, now we're down to 22. Okay, Revelation, now we're out of 20. How many epistles do we have? 21. Okay. Um, and uh, Paul wrote how many of those? Thirteen. Thirteen. All right, very good. And so that leaves eight what we call general epistles. Okay. Uh, are those all the letters in the New Testament? Are there just 21 letters in the New Testament? Any other? Pardon? Aren't they all written to someone? Yes, yeah, but the, the letter is a genre, it's a certain yeah. thing. Okay. Uh, seven in Revelation. Seven in Revelation. All right, now we're up to 28. And there's one in Acts. Uh, no, but there's a letter written in Acts uh, after the Jerusalem Council, Acts uh, 15. So there's actually 29, just to mess up your... Uh, uh, actual 29 letters in their testament, but of them that are, you know, separate pre-standing letters, there's 29. Yeah. Isn't it possible that 1 John, 2 John, 3 John are really just one letter? Too? Well, they were a bundle of letters uh, that, that likely went together. One was the introduction, and, uh, one was the commendation of carrier and all that, and the other was probably like the sermon. So yeah, they're, they're, they kind of... They don't necessarily flow together, but they're related to one another. Yeah. So, a bundle. Right? Okay, so Paul's letters. Um, what would you guess is the literacy rate in the Roman Empire? Paul's writing a letter to the house churches in Rome. What do you think the literacy rate was? 10%. All right, yeah. 10%. Some would argue even 5%. <coughs> so, Paul's writing a letter to the Roman house churches. What is he? Given the literacy rate, what's he going to be thinking about then? Okay. All right. That uh, he's writing this letter so it will be read in the assemblies, the house churches that meet, and there's several of those in Rome. And so it's written to be read and heard. Is it? So he's not going to put a lot of visual clues in the manuscript in his letter. He's going to put in oral clues, isn't he? So it's, it's written to be read and heard by the vast majority of the people, and that makes it then more like a speech, doesn't it? Or, or like a sermon. And, uh, and, and so some people use uh, a, a, a wonderful ancient discipline called rhetorical criticism to, to see how uh, in these letters they're put together rhetorically. That is in terms of putting together uh, a, an argument. You know, there's a purpose and, and all of that that to help you uh, understand and see what's going on. Now, um, how do uh, ancient letters begin? What's the first part of a letter? It's a greeting, okay? And uh, in ancient letters, what would you guess is always the first word? The writer's name, that's right, and that's exactly what we have here, Paul. That's what they, they start with the author's name. Usually then, a greeting could be as short as three words. The author's name, the recipient's name, usually in what we call the dative case, it's one word, but it would be to such and such. So it could be Paul, the Romans, the dative case, it's one word. And then it could be as short as, then uh, a third word, greetings, Greek word kyrene. Could be as short as three words. How long is Paul's greeting in Romans? Look at it here. It's as long as it is. How long is it? According to our numbering system, it's seven verses. 
The next longest is Galatians. Most of them are one or two verses. So this one is really long. All he had to say was Paul to the Romans. Hello. <laughs> Why do you think it's elongated? And oh, by the way, there's a lot of very significant theology that he's never been there before. He's not Papa Paul to them spiritually, is he? He didn't plant this church. Somebody else planted it. How long ago? And we don't know exactly who that was. Probably, the best guess is, it would be Jewish folks from the synagogues uh, in Rome who went to uh, Passover and <coughs> Pentecost uh, in the year that Jesus was crucified and resurrected. And so then the day of Pentecost comes and these pilgrims are there from the Roman synagogues and uh, there were at least 13 Roman synagogues and uh, several of them came to faith in Christ. They stayed on for X number of months or a year or so. Remember the, the Jewish Christians started selling lands and homes and you know all the resources they had to feed and clothe these apparently thousands of people that stayed on there to learn about the, the faith in Messiah Jesus. And so then after they stayed on and were trained and taught, they went back to Rome and uh, went into the synagogues, wherever they were from, and uh, taught that Jesus was the Messiah. And that went okay for a while, but eventually it caused problems. And uh, the emperor kicked out uh, all the Jewish people, because they were fighting over a certain, a Roman writer tells us, a certain Christus, probably a kind of a misunderstanding of Christos, Christ. So, all right, so the church is about 20 years old, or more, a little over 20 years old. And Paul didn't plan it, and he's never been there. So this is a very different communication thing for him, isn't it? His other letters, uh, almost all of them are to churches he planted, or, <coughs> for example, with Colossians, he may have been to Colossae, but it might have been people he trained in Ephesians who went out and planted the church in Colossae. So he's not the direct father of them, but he's kind of the spiritual grandfather of them. Uh, so this is a different thing, all right? So that's one reason there's a very elongated greeting. Seven verses. Amazing. Dense, illogically. Powerful verses. Okay. Uh, we don't have time to go through that, but let's talk about uh, the next section. Normally, there's a greeting. What's the, in most of Paul's letters, kind of follows a general pattern in uh, Greco-Roman letters, very broadly. Uh, what's the, usually there was a blessing. Uh, or uh, saying something like, may Zeus give you good health. That's what the pagans would do. Okay. Uh, something like that. And so Paul takes that into account, that kind of a cultural pattern. And so what does he normally do in this next section? Okay. And so I thank God for you. What kind of a prayer is that then, obviously? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. It's like who's buried in Grant's tomb. That's kind of one of those. Okay. I thank God. It's a Thanksgiving, isn't it? So he generally will uh, choose to thank God for something about this group of people. And again, if this is functioning like a speech or a sermon then, after uh, his uh, greeting, this is where, and the greeting many times, uh, we'll have a little something about them, but if it's expanded, it may be about the author himself, and that's the Romans is somewhat about the greeting in verses one through seven is somewhat about Paul and his mission. So the Thanksgiving then is a time to turn to the recipients of the letter, in this case the Roman Christians and the house churches, and to say something nice about them. Listen. And uh, to thank God for them, uh, that would be one of the things, but then also to connect with them. So listen to how he does this. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. This is Romans 1 verse 8 because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Wow, that's a nice stroke, isn't it? <laughs> Ooh, you're sitting there in the Roman house churches. Yeah, he knows about us. We're special. 
He explains, For God, whom I serve in my spirit, in the preaching of the gospel of the Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. Okay? Several, that's a typical complex Pauline sentence there, isn't it? Okay? So, uh, what does he say in verses 9 and 10? Yeah, I would love to see you because I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you and I've been praying that I'd be able to come to you. But I haven't been able to and it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Whose fault is it? <laughs> it's God's fault. It wasn't the will of God. Okay, lest you be tempted, you know, I didn't get my paper done on time. It just wasn't the will of God. <laughs> uh, let me just say, if you had a apostolic status like the Apostle Paul, I would defer to uh, your statement. But given you're not quite there yet, uh, I don't think I'd use that argument, okay? Well, why hasn't it been the will of God for Paul to be in Rome? Let's talk a little bit of geography for a moment. Where has he been? What has he been doing? All right, he's been in Asia Minor or Turkey, been working there. Okay. Where else has he been? Galatia. Galatia, that's in, yeah, in, in uh, modern day Turkey, in Asia Minor. Okay. He's been in uh, Greece, hasn't he? Northern Greece, Macedonia, Southern Greece, Achaia. So he's been in the eastern, really kind of the northeastern part of the Mediterranean world, hasn't he? For. Uh, many years now. And uh, Rome is, of course, uh, in Italy, it's uh, just about the furthest west of any of the churches now, isn't it? So he's been in the east, and Rome is way out in the west, and so there's a good reason why he hasn't been there. It wasn't the will of God. God wanted him to stay in the east and plant these churches and get them established. And he's been faithfully doing that. Okay? So, uh, the fact that he mentions it, he's going to mention it again here, shows it must have been an issue. You know, we're 20-something years old, why haven't you been here? And so, he's explaining why he hasn't, uh, and trying to perhaps take away some of the, a little bit of ill will that there might be towards him, because he hasn't visited them. Okay, but he knows about them, and he's been praying for them, so that kind of offsets him. All right, now we want to encounter now verse 11, which is the first of our two interpretive problems in this whole passage. Again, these are not great doctrines of the faith that hinge on this. Okay, but um, it is an issue. Verse 11, for I long to see you in order that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. Wow. I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to you. What in the world does that mean? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Impart some spiritual gift to you. All right? He can't do it from a distance, but if he's there, he can, if proximity, if he's close, he can impart some spiritual gift. What, what, is, what in the world does that mean? First thing that comes to mind. Encouragement. Okay. Um, and uh, let's say your entree in the discussion is to give your name. So, Niftali. Okay. Uh, Niftali, what... Um, how are you understanding spiritual gift then? Well, I don't think in this, my understanding is in this passage is not talking necessarily about talk, talking about uh, the functional gifts, more, okay. more of the result of the importation of spiritual gifts. Okay. No joy, All right. encouragement. So, uh, in other words, you're not taking spiritual gifts as a technical term. That's right. Not, uh, like he not, talks about elsewhere. Paul yeah, tells us no a lot about the spiritual yeah. gifts. Yeah, there's at least 19 of them. So he could be using it technically, but your sense is he's using it less technically. More, more of a product of those technical gifts. Okay. Yes. All right, good. Okay. All right. See, and, and that's something we'd want to try to prove and validate that. All right. Uh, somebody else, a little different? I kind of read it as like releasing an anointing for like demonstrable gifts of healing or prophecy. Okay. All right. And a lot of folks take it that way, that he's going to come, and as an apostle, that he has, as an apostle, the ability to impart uh, spiritual gifts to folks, perhaps the laying on his hands or praying for folks. 
And uh, there's a whole wing of the church, uh, uh, charismatic and Pentecostal, and kind of maybe the third wave, or recently, the wing of the church that would use this verse and understand it. Uh, the fact that uh, the giving of spiritual gifts it isn't just uh, as most evangelicals believe at the moment of salvation when the spirit uh, baptizes you and he also gifts you as he chooses but that the giving of gifts that it happens then but it it is also kind of open-ended and there could be uh, subsequent times and places where uh, spiritual gifts are given and this is uh, perhaps exhibit a for that this passage but under here you see that okay but let's look at it more closely what does it specifically say I I uh, looking forward to come to you that I may impart some spiritual gift singular is it <clears throat> A blue light special on a certain one particular gift that he's uh, you know, focusing on now. It's some spiritual gift. Not all the gifts, not several of the gifts, but in parts. You, you see, it's, it's kind of vague, isn't it, the language? So it could mean that, but it's, it's yeah. the, the language is not real friendly to that interpretation. But that there's a lot of folks that take it that way. Yes? Uh, it almost seems like uh, he's assuming they know what he's talking about. Like if you're talking to a friend, like, hey, I'm going to give you yeah. that thing, but okay. you both know what it is, even though you don't have to be specific. Okay, all right, good point. Could be, yeah. Could be a familiar language to them. Uh, okay. What's going to be the impact of that, the, the imparting the spiritual gift? Paul's going to impart it. What's the impact? All right. Yeah. Uh, at verse 12, but look at the end of verse 11. He may be established or grounded. Hmm. Now, he just said their faith was proclaimed throughout the whole world. And yet, somehow, when he comes and he imparts whatever this is, that it's going to have a rather foundational impact for them. Uh, now that's a pretty bold thing to say, isn't it? You're 20 something years old, yes, your faith is proclaimed throughout the whole world, but I'm gonna come and impart something and, and you need that to be kind of grounded and established. Now that's a subtle thing, but when you think about it, wow, that's a pretty bold thing to say, isn't it? To a church you didn't plan, you've never been there. Okay. Uh, wasn't Paul trying to actually express Jesus Christ in, in a different form to Romans to actually understand and try to grasp because uh, try to contextualize first in order to express Jesus Christ in, in a different way that can actually can grasp. So he probably trying to uh, say that, you know, I'll probably impart to you or bless you. Uh, okay, again, uh, uh, impart some spiritual gifts. Simply another way of talking about, explaining about who Jesus Christ is and that. Yeah, it could be. Again, taking it more of a non-technical non sense, okay? Um, yeah, okay, but you can see this is, this people kind of scratch their head on this. What, what is this? Now, uh, let's do verse 12, and then, uh, then let's think a little bit about the culture. Um, I long to see you in order that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is... Hmm, here's another way of expressing it. That I may be encouraged together with you, while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. Hmm. All right, what do we learn about then Paul wanting to part of spiritual gift? What, what do we learn in this verse about it? He's not just interested in what he can <coughs> going to give them, but that he's interested in a mutuality, isn't it? That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? There's something they can give to the great apostle that would encourage him. Isn't that wonderful? That is a humble thing, isn't it? Okay, what else? Whatever he's going to impart is going to be an expression of his faith, isn't it? And whatever they uh, give him will be an expression of their faith. Okay. That's, that's a significant thing. Um, we may be encouraged by these expressions of each other's faith. Now, um, what is your name? Eric. Eric. 
Are you married? No. Have your parents been to a lot of other folks' weddings? Yes. Did they give gifts to their friends' children when they got married? Mm -hmm. Yes. What is their expectation uh, if and when you get married? Those parents or those friends that they gave gifts to, they need to reciprocate. Now, I don't, I don't want to be crass about that, but do they keep <laughs> records about who, who gives what they give or who gives what? It's not that, not that accounting like I assume is. But they do expect reciprocity, right? And, and much of the world is that way, isn't it? When you give someone a gift, then they, uh, uh, in a sense, are honor-bound to reciprocate in some way, aren't they? That's just, that's just the way uh, most cultures around the world work. And so Paul introduces that dynamic. He says, I'm going to come and I'm going to impart a gift. We don't know exactly what that means right now. Uh, to you. And uh, then that's going to set in motion this thing of reciprocity. And uh, uh, that's going to encourage your faith when I give you this gift. And then you're going to encourage my faith by giving some gift. See what's in play, and, and, and that's uh, quite uh, clear what he's appealing to here is the, is this wonderful principle of reciprocity, isn't it? And that's the way almost I, probably there's not too many cultures around the world that don't have a real sense of that. <coughs> okay, well let's see what he expects from them then, what they can give. Verse 13, and I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I plan to come to you and have been prevented thus far. Wow, it popped up again, didn't it? There's that issue. It must be a little bit of a problem with them. And he's saying, I've been prevented, of course, by the Lord. He wants to come in order that I might obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. Oh, so he wants to obtain some fruit among them. Now, I know some of you are reading the NIV and it says something a little bit different. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, what's the first thing that comes to mind? He wants to come that he might obtain some fruit among them. First thing that comes to mind. He's hungry. He's hungry, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> some of the less spiritual ones of us, Wes. <laughs> Tangerines, orange. <laughs> Don't go shopping. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, so it could be literal fruits. You know, he knows they have great apples. And, well, okay, it could be that, but most of you are too spiritual. Okay. What else, Mike? Conversion. Okay. Uh, fruit of conversion. Evangelistic fruit. And and that, by the way, is the majority view. And verses 14 and 15, where he says, I'm anxious to come and preach the gospel, or I'm under obligation, seem to undergird that, doesn't it? And so, the NIV translation doesn't say obtain some fruit among you, but what, how does it express? What does it say? Harvest. Have a harvest among you. All right? You see, that pushes you kind of more to a harvest of evangelistic fruit. And so let's, uh, we'll talk about this next time, but the dynamic equivalent translation, see they try to be a little more explicit and take away the vagueness of this. And the majority view, uh, if you look at a hundred Romans commentaries, probably 90 of them would understand Verse 13, as Paul wants to come and have evangelistic fruit. He wants to come and evangelize them. Yeah, Ken. Ken. Um, he's, he's saying, though, that he, I mean, he's writing to the Romans at their church, and they're already, they've already been evangelized. Okay. So yeah, that's a problem, isn't it? The majority yeah. view is a problem, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, what else is a problem about it? Huge problem. Later on in the letter. What's Paul's role on the team? Well, he's never been there, and it doesn't look like he's going to get to come. So. All right. Good chance he might not be there. Does he go around visiting established churches? <clears throat> Does he do that? Absolutely. Have so. you ever been to a, a church established by somebody else? Mm -hmm. Other than Antioch, verse 21 to? No. 
What's his role on the team? What does Paul do? He plants churches. He's a pioneer evangelist. He's a pioneer church planter. Uh, look in chapter 15. Let me begin in verse 14 of Romans 15. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. That's, again, a wonderful encouragement of them. But I've written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given me from God. Now that's kind of a buzzword, the phrase that Paul uses, and it sets up him talking about his apostolic calling by Jesus to go to the Gentiles. And that's exactly what it is, verse 16. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, that my offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, Therefore in Christ I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God, for I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. He's not claiming the credit for this, is he? Resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, that's way up in northwestern Greece, way up in northwestern Macedonia. Okay? So from Jerusalem all the way over the northeastern part of uh, of the, the Mediterranean world. I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Here we go, verse 20. And thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, that I might not build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. Hmm. Wow. What's his calling? What's his philosophy of ministry? Pioneer evangelism. Pioneer church planting. So, has he been looking forward to coming to Rome for years so that he could do evangelism with an area where there's a 20 something year old established church? That's the majority view, folks. Okay, so. Uh, that's, I think that's a problem with Paul's own words. And so you're left to say, well, okay, so he's a little bit consistent. <coughs> oh, no, 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 he's far too smart for that. No. I don't think he's inconsistent. I think there's something wrong with your interpretation. That's a more likely thing, isn't it? Okay? So, uh, we really don't know what it means, but we've got two problems. What does it mean he wants to impart some spiritual gift and what does it mean that he wants to obtain some fruit among them? Is it an evangelistic harvest? What other kind of fruit might it be other than literal fruit? Evangelistic fruit? So, um, indirect financial support. Okay, financial support. Clinton, uh, just like kingdom expansion, so not just souls being saved, but just okay. God's kingdom. All right. All right. Uh, it could relate to his statements about fruit of the Spirit and, you know, fruit of the whole spiritual life, growth in Christ. Okay, it could relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it seems like there's something he wants to teach them, possibly um, make like, their faith is good in a lot of ways, but like there's something missing. Yeah, all right. <coughs> John, yeah. he could be looking for uh, people to that he could train to go out with him. Equip them to do the same. Yeah, okay, absolutely. All right, so the fruit of equipping, the fruit of, you know, developing them, yeah. Okay, that's, that was his job on the team, was to train, equip, and to take people with him to hit the beaches first, where Christ was not named. And yeah, that's a, a tough duty. Okay, we got two problems right at the beginning of the letter here. Let me offer two solutions to you. And uh, you're not going to like the first one, okay? This is the best advice I can give you. All semester, this is probably the best thing I can say. If you have a problem understanding something, a biblical book, then read that biblical book over and over and over and over. 
you say, read this book, that makes sense, it, okay, all right, our terminology is important. It's not a book, it's a letter. That sounds a lot shorter, doesn't it? It's a letter. It's like a long letter. 16 sections of this letter, okay? It's a letter. Have you ever sat down and just read Romans in one, one city? It's, it's pretty long and complex. Of course, it's, it was written for people to sit there in the house churches and to hear it in one city. Why? I don't know about you and your congregation, but I think a lot of folks would be <laughs> dead asleep by about chapter 3 or 4, you know, let alone through all 16. So, yeah, again, this was for an oral culture. They were good listeners, and they could hear something read two or three times, and they pretty well have it memorized. They really developed a wonderful capacity of human memory. Okay? So, read Romans over and over and over and over. And if you do that, you will get a good feel for the flow of the whole argument of the letter. You'll get an incredible sense of what this letter is about. And in particular, you will notice something structurally about it. I'm having to do this because I'm not getting the uh, PowerPoint for it. You will notice that in Romans 1, 1 through 17, that there are nine topics that are introduced by Paul. And when you get to Romans chapter 15, verses 14 to 33, those same nine topics are revisited. Now, what are the odds of that just randomly happening? What are the odds? Nine for nine. It's not random, is it? It's very intentional. Okay, so at the beginning and at the end, nine topics are introduced, nine topics are revisited. Now, <coughs> unpack that. What's the significance of that? What's the, what's the so what? Teaching. He's teaching and reinforcing. Okay, so there's a certain reinforcement. Okay. You, you teach something, and then, or you mention something, and you come back, you visit, okay? So it's a good educational thing. What else? There are yeah. definite the there are definite themes that he wants you to grasp throughout the whole book. Okay. Or letter. Yeah, and if you miss it on the front end, he's going to revisit it on the back end, isn't he? What do we call that when a, either a passage or in this case a whole biblical book, when you get this kind of uh, but this kind of a dynamic. What, what do we call that? What's just structurally? What is? You know, what we call this introduction and conclusion. Okay, yeah, it's introduction and conclusion. Uh, but the, the, the technical term we call them bookends uh, or or brackets, bracketing, and and so. What uh, Paul does is he brackets the whole body of the letter, and that's what's in between is the body of the letter, the main part of the letter is what's in between. And this is, yes, like an introduction and a conclusion, but the introduction is very intentional and specific. It's not haphazard, and the conclusion is to revisit those nine points. Very specifically, and then these topics. Then, well, do these tell us what the letter is about? No. The fact that Paul wanted to visit them and hadn't been able to does that tell us what the letter is about? Not necessarily. That he wants to have some fruit among them. Is that what the letter is about? No, not necessarily. But it tells us of what's important to him and to kind of give them a set of glasses as to how to listen to or read this letter. 
So these nine topics are important in terms of glasses, in terms of perspective. That makes sense? It's not what it's about, the whole thing, but it's about how to, to read this and think about these issues as you do listen to this letter or you read this letter. Now, also, what would you expect if an author is going to revisit those nine topics, what would you expect the second time around on the back bracket? Clarification. Clarification, yeah. It'll have more meaning than before. All right, absolutely. He's going to clarify it. He's going to give you a little <coughs> more specifics. He's going to unpack it. He didn't want to go into all that at the beginning. It is an introduction. You don't want to go into so much detail when you're introducing something that you lose, you know, you lose your listeners with too much detail. So we would expect, uh, as he comes back to these things, that there'll be a little more development. So uh, our two issues happen to be uh, the two of those nine topics. So we would expect there be something about it and help us out on interpreting which is why you can't really understand and interpret Romans 1 verse 11 and 13 without reading the whole letter can you how about that you can look at the surrounding context from now until the Lord comes and you still probably won't understand what verses 11 to 13 mean but if you will read Romans, how much? All over, and over, and over. And of course, each time you're gaining insight, aren't you? You're seeing what his ongoing theme and purpose is. You're seeing structurally how this thing fits together. It's a very complex letter, isn't it? It's very complex. But he expected these dear folks sitting in these Roman house churches to hear it and to understand it. Get it? Isn't that amazing? He, he, he was shooting pretty high, wasn't he? Okay, so that's uh, one thing that I can tell you that will be very helpful for you to read something over and over and over, the whole thing, the whole letter, the whole the book, to help you solve some of the smaller issues and problems. And the, most of the time, it will resolve the vast majority of those issues. So that's one thing to do. That's one approach interpreting. A second thing, and I'm following your notes on page one here, a second thing would be to uh, look and to see uh, how the author uses a, a troublesome word, key word, okay? Uh, let's take the word fruit. Again, you have ideas uh, a little bit handicapped here. That's okay. We'll talk about that next time. I'll show you the more excellent way. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. My own wife reads the NIV, so my own house is divided. <laughs> I haven't been able to persuade her from my side yet. Um, what tool would you look uh, in if you wanted to see how Paul used the word fruit? A concordance, okay? And um, you would want to use a concordance to a literal translation. You could use one to the old King James if you want. You can get those very cheaply, you know, use whatever. Or you can get a concordance to the English Standard Version or to the New American Standard Version, but a concordance to a, a literal translation where they're not changing terms, but they're consistent in their, their terms. And if you looked at a concordance, you would notice that uh, Paul, uh, you know, uses fruit, of course, in Romans 1.13, and I think it's then in 7.5. And then again, in chapter 15, verse 28. And we'll look at that in a minute. Now, when you look at your concordance, and, and here's the rule of thumb. You don't have to look up all the usages of fruit in the New Testament. No, 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 no. You don't have to do that yet for this. You want to look at 
the usages in Romans. And if that doesn't solve your problem, then you would you would go outward from there. Uh, after looking at Romans, and if that didn't help you see how Paul uses fruit, where would where would you go then? Other Pauline letters. Other, other Pauline letters. That's kind of the next circle out. Okay, and if that doesn't solve your problem, where do you go? In the concordance. What are the usages of fruit? The rest of the New Testament. Okay, the rest of the New Testament. That doesn't solve your problem. Where do you go? Now we're up past the concordance. Okay, you look at the the Old Testament usage, and particularly if you're if you can use Greek, you would look at the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, since much of the New Testament quotes that and uses that. And if that doesn't solve your problem, then you go to extra biblical Greek, and the usage is outside there. But that's the big picture, and that's if you're really, really getting into it and writing a doctoral dissertation, okay? You go through all those concerning circles. But for us, the quick and easy way is to first look at the usage of fruit in Romans and see if that helps you. Now, what should catch your eye about these three usages here? Beginning, middle, end. All right, it's kind of in the beginning, beginning, the middle, the end, all right? And you probably want to look at all three. What else? The two of them exist in the two bookend section. Ah! Bracket number one, bracket number two. All right. Let's work our way up to verse 28 in Romans chapter 15. He just told them about his philosophy of ministry to go where those who had no news of Christ would see and they've not heard, they would understand. Verse 22. For this reason I have often been hindered from coming to you. Here we go again. Okay. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, in other words, his work of pioneering in the East is finished. Gosh, there's still a lot of work to do, isn't there? Because of Christ? Oh, yes. It's just kind of been roughed in. It's just the beginning. But his job as a pioneer missionary, pioneer evangelist, pioneer church planter is finished. And others are now fulfilling their roles. Okay? So there's but now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I've had for many years a longing to come to you, whenever I go to Spain. To Spain? Oh, my goodness. Spain is on the far, far western border of the Mediterranean, isn't it? So he doesn't want to just go to Rome. He wants to go past Rome all the way to Spain. He's been in the East, and now here he is, this old beat-up guy, probably from 60, and if you want to read his medical chart, 2 Corinthians 11, verses uh, 19 and following, he's, he's been beat to a pulp, this guy, verses 23, 29, excuse me, verse, 2 Corinthians uh, 11, verses 23 to 29. He has been beaten up. He's got scars from head to toe. And yet here he is, well past the average age of a man, who's about 40, and he's pushing 60, and he's still pioneering. He wants to go to the west, to Spain. Wow, amazing. Okay? For whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in Rome in passing, and to be helped on my way there by you when I first enjoyed your company for a while. He always wanted to travel with people. <coughs> group oriented culture you don't do things alone did Jesus ever spend much time alone just doing stuff singularly rarely he's surrounded by at least 12 and generally a lot more than that it's so unusual for him to be alone that the gospels will note that Jesus went out to be alone to pray that's the exception isn't it Generally, he probably prayed and was right smack in the middle of all of his followers, wasn't he? So Paul doesn't want to go to Spain alone, and it's too far west to, to draw people from his home base in Antioch over in the east. So he needs this westernmost church to, to provide teammates and partners uh, and, and maybe language help because they speak Latin in the west, and he knows some Latin, but... Uh, He's much more fluid in Greek. The language of the Eastern part of the So, so he, he needs help from the Roman believers. Boy, that would be cool to be able to go with the Apostle Paul, wouldn't it? 
and I hope to see you in passing to be helped on my way there by you when I first enjoyed your company for a while. But now, I'm going to Jerusalem. Oh my goodness, if you weren't geographically confused yet. Now, here we go. So he's, he's in the east. He wants to go west to Spain through Rome, but before he can go west, he has to go east to Jerusalem. Wow, he's got all kinds of travel plans here. But now, verse 25, I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints. He explains, verse 26, for Macedonia and Achaia, northern and southern Greece, have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Okay, the Jerusalem collection. Verse 27, yes, they were pleased to do so, and they were indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Now that's the principle. Okay, who are the players? Two, two sets of players and two responses here. Okay, two different. Who gave the spiritual things? Jerusalem Church. The Jerusalem Church, the Jewish Christians, the Messianic Jews. The gospel went out from them. Paul was one of that, isn't he? He was a Messianic Jew, took the gospel of the Gentiles. All right? So it, they gave spiritual things, and the Gentiles were recipients of that, and they are honor bound. They are indebted, so to speak, before God to give back material things. All right? And Paul, up to this point, has spent 12 years collecting for the Jerusalem saints. It's been an ongoing thing. All right? Verse 28, Therefore, when I have finished this and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on by way of you to Spain. Hmm. How's he using fruit? The collection. Okay. Now, to call a collection fruit, what kind of language? What, what's he doing here? Why not just call it the collection? What, what is he doing when he calls it fruit? It's a, it's a euphemism. It's a euphemism. Yeah. So do you have a dog or a cat? Uh, have you? Yes. Okay. And if word got out that your cat or dog had just died, and I were talking to you, I'd want to be gentle about that, right? And I wouldn't say, I understand your, your animal's rotting in the, in the grave right now. No, I would say something theologically questionable like, I understand your dog, your cat has gone to doggy heaven. And, uh, yeah, and the, the great afterlife for animals and beyond. Um, I would use a euphemism. Or, and we do that with death, don't we? Passed away in German as they go up, going around the corner. You know, different, every language has those kinds of things. So this is a euphemism for a sensitive topic, isn't it? Collection of money. And so he uses a euphemism, fruit. Now, wow, that's kind of strange, isn't it? Does, does that make any sense back in chapter one? I want to, uh, when I plan to come to you, and in this part, in order that I might obtain some fruit among you also, some collection among you? Is that what he's saying in 113? You said it's the same nine topics, so I guess so. Oh, don't take my word for it now. <laughs> okay, then I might obtain some collection among you. Well, notice how he says, even as among the rest, of the Gentiles. Oh, he specifies it, doesn't he? If it's evangelistic fruit, did he just go to Gentiles and have evangelistic fruit just among Gentiles? No. In fact, he would always go first to the synagogue in a town if they had one, wouldn't he? He had evangelistic fruit from both Jews and Gentiles. Now, he was the apostle of the Gentiles, but he went to both of them. Okay? Uh, does that fit that I may have some collection among you, even as among the rest of the Gentiles? Now, it's vague in Romans 1.13, but he defines and specifies what the fruit is when he revisits it in 15.28, doesn't he? You see 
seem unpersuaded. Okay, let me throw <laughs> another log on the fire. <laughs> does this help us understand verse 11? How does it help us understand verse 11? But I want to impart some spiritual gift to you. Spiritual gift. Well, yeah. Pardon? Because he specifically said spiritual gift. All right. It mirrors on the other side over there. He was saying that the saints in Jerusalem gave that spiritual gift and the Gentiles right. reciprocated that with that. That's right. All right. So Paul says, I want to give you, how about this for a paraphrase, a gift of a spiritual sort. Not a spiritual gift, technical term, but a gift of a spiritual sort. What would that probably be? His explanation of the gospel to them. Not evangelistically, but the gospel which he has already introduced in verses 1 through 7 as this ancient plan or program that God has. It started with Israel and through all Israel moving forward. But God has his plan or program to bless all the people groups of the world. And he says in verse 9, I serve in it. Right in the midst of this plan. And so do we, by the way. And so the Romans, he wants to come and give them a gift of a spiritual sort, which will be, remember, an expression of his faith. And then they are going to respond with an expression of their faith. And it's going to be financially, but not for him, but for the poor Jerusalem saints. But he doesn't want to get into explaining all that right now. You know, he doesn't want to say, hey, I'm coming and I'm going to pick your pockets. <laughs> I'm going to take money from you. I'm going to have a big vacuum cleaner. No, he's not going to say that. He doesn't do that, does he? But he's intentionally vague, isn't he? He introduces it, but we don't really understand it. And we won't until we see him revisit it and explain it. And then it makes total sense, doesn't it? Now, that's good communication, isn't it? To a church he didn't plant, to believers, most of whom don't know him real well. He knows a few of them. That's good communication, isn't it? That's wise communication. That's thoughtful. He's not... He introduces something, but we don't fully understand what it is. But he's... he's he, he lays it out there, but he does it in kind of uh, euphemistic language. But he's going to explain that later on. Isn't it? So why would he want to include the Romans in this collection for the poor Jerusalem saints that's been going on for these 12 years? Why would he want to include them? It's probably a lot. Pardon? Romans, so it's probably pretty prosperous area. All right. They may be prosperous, have resources. You want us to make them a part of the church of Jerusalem. Make, make a part of the church. All right. He wants to tie, the, if you will, the easternmost, uh, the easternmost church together with the westernmost church, doesn't he? Yeah. Geographically, he wants to tie those together, doesn't he? But even more than geography, what's more important? Ethnicity, isn't it? It's Gentile believers, of which the Roman church is largely Gentile believers now, with Jewish believers in Jesus. So this thing does split into a Jewish wing and a Gentile wing. And what's a great way to keep it together? Financially tie them together because where your money is, there is your heart follows right <laughs> You give, you invest. So, this, see, he's got a grander plan afoot, doesn't he, here? He understands the gospel of God, this ancient plan to bless all the peoples of the world, goes certainly back to creation, but specifically to Father Abraham. He understands that, and he wants to come and give the Romans a gift of a spiritual nature of explaining that to them. Because they're 20 something years old, and oh, by the way, did you guys ever think of evangelizing Spain? No, you didn't. By the way, the Roman house churches are racked with racial and cultural things between Jews and Gentiles. The terms Jews and Gentiles occurs more in Romans than all of his other letters combined. They got internal problems, and the gospel addresses those, and he wants to heal their internal problems by explaining the gospel of God, the gospel plan, the program of God, but he also wants to mobilize them 
to be a part and play their role in the gospel of God and evangelize Spain. Because there's a really good chance that he's going to get killed when he takes that money to Jerusalem. Remember along the way, everybody says, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. He's going to spend five years in prison. Because he won't be killed, but he's kind of taken out of the, the picture for five years. He eventually makes it to Rome as a prisoner, doesn't he? So, why go on here? Two principles hermeneutically. Read the letter, read the biblical book over and over and over, and look for the specific usage of terms. Now, here's the point. Did any of you really know, unless you've heard this before, did any of you really know what these two things, impart some spiritual gift and obtain some fruit among you, did you know what that meant? No, you didn't. What saved you? Paul Hermeneutically speaking. Good hermeneutics. And see, you ended up then with an interpretation that went past your pre-understanding. It went past your existing knowledge. You see that? So you're not just limited to what you know now. And that's a terrible way to interpret, isn't it? If you're just interpreting things limited to what you know now, you'll never go beyond that, will you? But if you have a good methodology, good hermeneutics, that will carry you beyond your pre-understanding. That is what you now know. And that's something. And so you'll end up with an interpretation you wouldn't even have conceived of before. But that's what the author is saying. And so we want to let the author speak for himself. We don't want to just read our stuff into it. And to do that, brothers and sisters, you need good hermeneutics. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.